At this time, I'm going to introduce Michael Peters, who is the Director of Organizational Development and Training at CBNI. And Mike's experience focuses on aligning training strategies with business performance goals. Today, he's going to be moderating a panel of <clears throat> analysts to talk about the economic outlook of capital projects. So quickly on Mike's team, from an energy analyst, John Hours of Turner Mason and Company, healthcare analyst, Frank Morgan of RBC Capital Markets, and construction and engineering analyst, Steve Fisher of UBS Investment and Research. So if you gentlemen would come up and start your panel uh, <coughs> presentation, we'll all appreciate it. And then we'll be done for an exciting evening. Thank you. All right, well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, if you remember back Tuesday morning uh, with Stephen's introduction, he talked a little bit about some of the changes going on in, in, in CII, and one of those was the focus on you know, the business, the focus on the business. Mike said it yesterday as well. And so for those of you that have been to the conferences in the past, this is a little bit different, where rather than having kind of one economists talk kind of macroly about everything that's going on. We really, and they decided to, to really focus more on the markets and the business. So what you're gonna be hearing is from three different sectors, three different individuals. I'll introduce them one at a time. They're gonna come up, they've got a few remarks they'll go through, and then after that's done, we'll open it up to, uh, to question and answers. There'll be uh, some folks roaming around with microphones, so just raise your hand, we'll, we'll get to you. And just as a reminder, before you ask your question, if you could uh, just state your name and the company that, uh, that you represent. And so go through this. So not only have I tried to get a Canadian elected, I'm now a moderator as we go through this. It's pretty good for me. Pretty good job security. I also do kids' parties and bar mitzvahs, so keep that in mind as we go. All right, so first up, I'd like to introduce Mr. John Ayers. Uh, he's the executive vice president for Turner & Mason Company, an international energy and consulting firm located in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he's the team leader of TMC subscription products and leads assignments in the areas of refining economics and planning, LP modeling, downstream asset valuation, crude oil evaluation, and capital investment, and strategic planning. John joined the firm in 1987 after seven years with Exxon Corporation. So if you will, please welcome John to the podium. John. Well, Frank, thanks a lot for that introduction, mm -hmm. and thank you all for staying so late. Uh, I really enjoyed my uh, first CII conference. Uh, what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes talking about the refining industry and some of the factors that drive capital spending and maintenance spending in that industry. Uh, it's important to note that every refinery is, is unique. And uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, they, they can vary significantly in, uh, in terms of capacity, uh, the types of crude they're capable of, of running, and the types of products they're capable of producing. Uh, in the United States, that range can span from relatively small inland uh, refineries, generally less than 100,000 barrels a day. This happens to be the, uh, the Marathon's uh, Canton refinery in Ohio to uh, uh, a bit larger, medium size, but still you know, running more medium to sweet crude uh, refineries on the, Gulf, on the coast. This is uh, the uh, Tesoro's Anacoras refinery on the Puget Sound to much larger refineries, uh, coastal refineries uh, that can run heavier crudes like Chevron's El Segundo refinery in Southern California uh, to uh, by many measures, the largest refinery in the U.S., uh, the Exxon's Baytown refinery, where I started my career. Uh, the one thing these refineries all have in common is they're very complex, even the, even the smaller ones. Many downstream units, as you can see in that diagram, uh, these uh, units all have different functions, operate in different ways. Uh, they, have, they also have significant uh, uh, off-sites infrastructure, things like t piping, storage tanks, uh, utility systems, wastewater systems, all very complex, have to operate around the clock, high temperatures, high pressures. And to keep these things running at acceptable utilization rates, you need a significant amount of both routine and turnaround maintenance. Turnarounds are, are very expensive, to require significant planning. Uh, all, almost all the major units require a, ma a turnaround every three to five years, and these turnarounds can last several weeks. And some of the multi, uh, large multi-train refineries can have a major turnaround uh, once a year or even more than once a year on some of their facilities. And it's important to execute 
uh, this, these maintenance activities effectively and efficiently because uh, unplanned downtimes can have major impacts on the economy. Last year when uh, Exxon lost their uh, gasoline producing uh, SEC unit in Torrance, California, Southern California, and was out all year, uh, that caused gasoline prices to be as much as $2 a, a gallon above the rest of the uh, country in that region for, for most of 2015. Uh, refining is per perhaps the most dominant and widespread manufacturing industry in the U.S. Uh, the, the, um, uh, well, let me go back one second there. The, the, there's over 130 refineries throughout the country. Uh, they concentrate on the Gulf Coast, but uh, they're, they're pretty widespread as well. Oh, 30 states have re operating refinery within their borders. The industry itself employs 70,000 people directly, but really uh, uh, supports over 3 million uh, people, including many of you here, including myself. That's over 1.5% of total jobs in the U.S. Uh, it accounts for over 4.5% of total U.S. GDP. The refining industry pays almost $12 billion a year in taxes, and uh, they, uh, the total replacement costs we've estimated of the U.S. refining industry would be $150 billion. Now, the arrow has been pointing up for the refining industry the last 10 years, and that's despite declining domestic demand. Uh, we've actually decreased the demand uh, consumption of refined products in the U.S. has actually declined by over a million barrels a day in the last 10 years. But at the same time, uh, refining has actually thrived and have done it by uh, uh, becoming a, a major exporter. We, at one time, 10 years ago, were the largest importer of refined products in the world. Now the U.S. is the largest exporter of refined products in the world. Exporting, uh, uh, the net export levels are over two and a half million barrels a day now, and the largest category of exports after automotive uh, exports by a do on a dollar basis. The U.S. refining system is the largest in, in the world. One-fifth of all world refining capacity is in the U.S. Uh, that's three million barrels a day more than number two China, and, uh, and, and four million barrels a day more than all of Western Europe. The more important the size is complexity of uh, U.S. Uh, refining system. Uh, more, uh, the U.S. refineries have two to three times as much downstream upgrading capacity uh, than uh, refineries in other regions of the world on average. That means they can run harder to process crudes and they can produce more highly valued products. Uh, now, in, worldwide, demand has been growing. Demand has grown by nine million barrels a day, over nine million barrels a day over the last 10 years. And uh, refineries have had to expand by 11 million barrels a day, a net expansion of 11 million barrels a day during that time frame. Now, most of that, almost all of that demand growth has taken place in developed countries, much of it in Asia, the Pacific region. Uh, and as, it, uh, to respond to that, most of that uh, refinery construction has taken place in those countries. Uh, in developed, uh, the developed economies in Europe, Western, uh, or uh, developed parts of, a of Asia, like Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, they've actually had significant rationalization of uh, refineries while their demand has, uh, domestic demand has fallen. But the United States has gone against that trend. We've actually increased refining capacity by over uh, almost a million barrels a day during that time frame. Now, there's a lot of reasons why uh, for the superior performance of the U.S. refining industry. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ones underlying a lot of the other reasons is, uh, is the free market environment they run in. Ever since uh, energy deregulation that, uh, that Reagan initiated in the early 80s, uh, we've had a, a, a really probably the freest market for the oil business of any place in the world. Now, this has uh, allowed uh, strong refineries to survive and thrive and, and, and you know, incentivized uh, efficiencies and also allowed weak refineries to, uh, to fall away, which is, doesn't necessarily take place everywhere else. That's led to that uh, more complex, more capable refining system than anywhere else in the world. We also have uh, a deeper, uh, more skilled, uh, more flexible workforce than uh, other parts of the world, much less restrictive work rules than you see in Europe and other developed countries. And uh, that combined with all the good work CII and the member companies and other organizations like this do uh, has led to the ability to execute capital projects, maintenance activities uh, much cheaper than in other parts of the world despite high wage rates. Now the, the, the cherry on this whole ice cream cone has been the shale boom that's taken place in the last few years. It's led to lower energy costs, lower natural gas costs for U.S. refiners and lower relative feedstock costs. Now you can't sit on your laurels, you, you have to continue to invest to, uh, to maintain competitiveness. And there's a lot, a lot of things that drive that investment. One of the key ones in the U.S. has been developments on the crude supply side. Uh, you know, as, as you find crude in new places, as that crude is of a different quality, you have to invest to be able to run that, to both access and run that crude efficiently. 
Uh, product uh, demand patterns change as well. Uh, product demand grows. You have to be able to produce more product, you have to produce the type of product consumers require. You have to invest to be able to do that. Regulators continue to issue new regulations, you know, that come from all segments, from the international bodies to, you know, primarily, you know, the, the national bodies like the EPA and OSHA are probably the biggest source of those regulations, but state and local authorities also issue regulations that have to be invested to comply with. And obviously, you have to replace obsolete equipment, you have to be able to deploy new technologies to stay competitive. This slide, I'm going to show some of the key uh, drivers that have uh, that have taken place uh, recently and are going to take place going forward in the U.S. In industry to, to uh, incentivize capital expenditures. Back in the 1990s, uh, the, we thought the world was running out of light, light sweet crude oil, but we had a significant supply of heavy crude oil coming out of Latin America and out of Canada, so refiners spent tens of billions of dollars retrofitting the refineries to be able to run that very hard to refine and process crude oil. Lo and behold, upstream uh, guys learned how to economically produce uh, light oil from uh, tight and shale formations, and uh, that switched in, in recent years. We spent billions of dollars uh, adding, uh, giving refiners the capability to run some of these very light, light oils and also to access those oils. Uh, you know, product uh, demand patterns have shifted as well. You know, we so, sort of went to a more of a diesel-centric world here in recent years, even though that's shifted a little bit here in the last couple of years with low, low prices but refiners invested to be able to produce more diesel, shape their product slates to meet uh, consumer demand. Uh, the uh, regulators have wanted to uh, limit emissions from uh, transportation sources, so uh, refiners had to spend a lot of money to, uh, uh, to, to uh, take uh, sulfur out of diesel, to take benzene and sulfur out of gasoline, and we're still at the tail end of, of this last tier three, which is reducing uh, gasoline sulfur uh, limits to 10 ppm, and still some investments taking place there. Going forward, there'll be more regulations, uh, increased uh, fuel efficiency standards, will probably require uh, higher octane gasoline, that will require additional investment. The International Maritime Organization is right this year considering when they're going to uh, start implementing low sulfur bunker, going, having over the water bunker uh, uh, fuel uh, to be at 0.5 sulfur, that's going to require investment, uh, maybe as not as much in Europe as the U.S. is in Europe, but still require investment. Uh, and refiners have to continually invest to modernize, uh, like I said, deploy that new technology, uh, keep uh, th their plants reliable. Uh, the AFPM, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, they commission a study every quarter, a commission uh, data to be generated every quarter to forecast capital spending and maintenance spending in the, uh, in the U.S. refining industry. That graph shows what, uh, what their latest second quarter forecast shows. shows uh, really rough, roughly staying fairly stable, about $9 billion a year in capital spending and 4 and a half to $5 billion a year in maintenance spending. What we use is we have a rule of thumb, generally for individual refineries and for the industry as a whole, that maintenance costs are generally about 3% of replacement costs. Those numbers are relatively consistent with that, uh, and, and so we, we feel those may, we're, we're fairly in agreement with that. We think defensive capital, that kind of capital is needed to comply with regulations to keep units reliable, replace obsolete, uh, obsolete units is about one to one and a half percent, about two billion a year. Uh, so by difference, uh, you know, their numbers show about seven billion a year of, of economic capital will be spent. Our view is actually that's probably going to be a bit less than that, uh, at least through 2019. Uh, so there, there's threats to the refining system. It's not all, it's not all uh, you know, good things. Uh, you know, certainly the ex uh, there's a threat to the export model, particularly important U.S. Gulf Coast refiners who export about a third of their product right now. Uh, you know, the market, uh, Latin America is their biggest market, 20% of Latin American uh, fuels is now comes from the United States, refined products come from the United States. Mexico receives more than 40% of their products from the United States. You're getting close to saturation levels. All those countries want to build refiners and have plans to do so, and there have been significant uh, construction of some uh, uh, export refiners to you know, compete with U.S. refineries. Good th this thing, helping U.S. refiners out there is, uh, those, uh, to build those facilities is much more expensive. They take, their schedules have run out, they've gone, and they haven't been able to execute those projects effectively. They haven't been able to operate those plants well. So I think we're going to do okay there. Honors regulation that uh, potentially decreases U.S. Ref, uh, refineries' competitiveness is a, is a threat. And, you know, generally economics uh, get rid of most of the, uh, you know, override most of the uh, in real uh, Real bad policies. We hope that can, it continues to be the case. Some policies can even be an advantage to the U.S. So the IMO low sulfur bunker fuel regulations will, will be more threatening to Europe. Europe's simple refineries probably cause more of them to shut down, actually advantaging the U.S. refining system. 
uh, competition for alternatives. Up to now, those have all been driven not by economics, but by, uh, by mandate, government regulations. Uh, just been nipping at the edges. Uh, we think that's going to continue for a while. We don't, th we don't see a threat from that, at least for the next 10 or 15 years of significant competition, especially in a relatively low oil price environment. And there's certainly other demand factors that uh, people worry about. Chinese demand, they've led the world in demand growth over the last uh, few years. Their growth is slowing, but India's taking its place. Other developing countries are taking its place. Overall, we think uh, you know, demand will, uh, for petroleum uh, products will continue to grow and uh, in average maybe about one million barrels a day. So we, we got a lot of room, a lot of growth left for this industry to take advantage of. Um, I won't spend much time because I want to get to my other guys here. We do a product where we assess all the uh, capital projects around the world and this is actually a th potential threat identifies potential threat to refiners. Overbuilding, always a threat to manufacturing industries. There's actually uh, 20, uh, 22 million barrels a day of capacity uh, expansions on the books. Now, we don't think that's going to get built. In fact, our view is about seven to seven and a half million barrels of that will actually get built. And we handicap all those projects, uh, you know, look, look at their impacts on crude demand, product supply, uh, when, when we do think they'll come online, if they do come on, and give probability rankings to all of them. And with that, I'll end my presentation and turn it over to I think. Mike. Mike, okay. Thank you. All Thank right. you all. Thanks, thanks, John. Really appreciate it. And again, as we go, again, as we go through, we'll have um, you know, three different sectors representative. So when, if you think of your questions, you can direct them to that specific individual or to the entire panel as well. But next up, representing the healthcare industry is Mr. Frank Morgan. Uh, he is the manager director with RBC Capital Markets in Nashville. Uh, Frank dedicates his current research to facility-based health care services, including acute care, hospitals, senior living services, and a range of specialty service, service providers, including institutional pharmacies, hospice care, long-term acute care, rehabilitation, and behavioral health services. Frank has 24 years of experience in equity research and investment banking. So please welcome to the podium Mr. Frank Morgan. Frank. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm with the capital markets business of the Royal Bank of Canada, and I tell everybody, if you've never heard a Southern Canada accent, this is what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm based in Nashville. Nashville is certainly the center of healthcare services uh, in the U.S. It really goes back, uh, all the way back to the 60s, uh, when one of the first for-profit hospital chains was started called HCA, many of you may have heard of. What I want to do is maybe just give you a broad context uh, about healthcare, and as I go through some of these things, hopefully it'll give you some ideas. But I, I thought what I would first do, start very high level, give you sort of a backdrop of where we are and why this industry probably could be very important to you. And I guess we'll start off with how much money is actually spent on healthcare in the U.S., about $3 trillion. Now that's 2014, so that's a couple of years dated. I'm uh, sorry, 2014, so a couple of years dated. But the reality is, uh, that's a lot of money. That's a big part of the U.S. economy. About half those dollars, if you look over there on the right side of the chart, you'll see that roughly half those, uh, how half healthcare is paid for in the U.S. is through the public sector, through programs like Medicaid, Medicare, uh, those kind of programs. The other half is through commercial insurance, out of pocket, those other kind of sources. In terms of where that $3 trillion gets spent today, today uh, about a third of it is spent in the hospital industry, another third within the physician and professional services sector. Uh, dr the drug industry has gotten a lot of uh, publicity of late about drug inflation. Today it's only about 10 percent uh, of overall health care spending, but uh, if I were thinking about the world from your context, that, that you know, uh, roughly a trillion dollars is spent, uh, uh, dollars that are spent every year in the hospital sector, it seems like that's a very ripe area, uh, and we'll talk about some of these other areas as well. Uh, is, is probably you all are probably employee people or, or aware of what's going on and probably when you pay for health care yourself, you'll know there's been a big problem with, with certainly with health care inflation in the U.S. Uh, the good news is health care inflation is actually has been coming down uh, to some degree. The bad news is still too high. Uh, the, the chart here basically just shows you what the trend is. It's a little bit messy, but generally speaking, you can see that trend line is down. Employee sponsored health benefits, you can see that has been coming down. Uh, nicely over the years, and as you all know, uh, each year you all are paying for more of your health care benefit. Uh, you, you can probably agree with that, the, that trend line there that you're paying more out of pocket today, either in the form of premiums or in co-pays and deductibles. But once again, this is all driven by the problem of inflation. Uh, I think this is kind of the chart that really brings it to home. This is why health care 
uh, why you had the Affordable Care Act, why, uh, it, why so many policy initiatives have been put in places to try to get at this problem. You all know as business people that you can't have a trend of eight, nine, 10 percent cost inflation in any of your cost items. Uh, that you just can't sustain that over the long run. The, the, the laws of compounding kind of get to you after a while. That's the problem we have in the U.S. today. Uh, Health care is consuming a bigger and bigger portion of our, our overall economy. Uh, and the way it looks right now, by 2014, you know, up towards 18, 19 percent of our uh, economic output will be consumed by health care spending. So I want to take a couple of minutes, and, and hopefully this will help you as you think about where you want to, uh, you know, attack areas for construction. Uh, just what have been some of these drivers? Like, why is why do we have so much healthcare inflation in the U.S. and why is it so different from anywhere else in the world? The the list on the left is just a, a list. There's there's certainly a lot of other ones, but this is sort of my top ten list of reasons. Uh, yeah, diagnostic technologies. We're very good at determining things that are wrong with you. We don't necessarily know how to fix you. Uh, you all, a lot of engineers out here, you fix things and you get returns on capital. You know exactly how much cash flow you can save by investing. It's a little bit harder in healthcare to do that. A lot of times we can find out things that are wrong with you. Uh, we may not necessarily have uh, the cure for it, but we, then we can, tr but we treat it. Uh, the way our world works today is we work in a world of fee-for-service medicine. It's all prefix. I'm sorry, it's all a la carte. If we were in a restaurant, everything you get in healthcare is typically a la carte. You pay by the item. The more stuff that gets done, uh, the more services are consumed, the more you get paid. So the economic model is, is a little bit different. Um, the moral hazard, that's basically um, most Americans are not very well educated as consumers of healthcare. We're starting to get a little bit of that right now because we're actually having to pay for more of health care. But really, it goes back to World War II. Um, Employee-sponsored health benefits really didn't exist in America until World War II. We had wage and price uh, controls during World War II. Uh, and one of the ways you could get around that is to, to give an incentive to a, an employee was to give them a health care benefit. So uh, for many, many years, we were given this health care benefit. It was like a blank check to go out and spend all the money you wanted to on health care. And that kind of started this process many, many, many years ago. So we're, we're going to talk about some of the changes that are occurring today uh, how, that, that may affect that in the future. Uh, certainly, our system overall is designed around intervention, not prevention. So we wait for people. We, we, we have pent-up health care demand. We wait for people to get really sick, and then you go to the doctor and incur big bills as opposed to try to prevent that. And then finally, demographics. This one is the one that everybody knows. 12,000 people are turning 65 every day. Uh, the, the Medicare population in the U.S. is absolutely going to explode over the next 20 years, and that will be part of that driver as you go forward. Um, just to give you some context, just to let you know I'm not kidding you here, uh, this is the U.S. Look at the U.S. compared. This is per capita spending on health care uh, relative to most of the other industrialized countries out there, and you'll see that their systems are different from ours, generally speaking, uh, and we spend a lot more money on health care. And generally speaking, if in the literature, uh, we don't necessarily produce a better uh, outcome, if you will. We're not like healthier than everybody else because we spend uh, almost twice what the average is. So I want to hit on one other thing, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that's a big demand driver in health care. Uh, certainly there, there are two components to the Affordable Care Act. There was Medicaid expansion, and then there was the famous public exchanges that, that had some very early problems that are up and running now. But since the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, uh, we have about 12 million uh, incrementally enrolled uh, Americans uh, in, in Medicaid. Uh, that number could be much larger. A lot of states just chose not to participate in Medicaid, but about 12 million uh, have people have become insured through Medicaid expansion in the U.S. Uh, another 2.5 million pick, picked it up uh, that basically didn't realize they were already qualified for it under the old system, uh, the woodwork effect. About 12.7 million Americans now have insurance on these these exchanges that you hear about where people go in and enroll every year. Uh, and we still think there's a lot of room for growth there. Uh, just a quick snapshot of those 12.7 million people who bought insurance or got insurance on exchanges, uh, about 83% of those people got a subsidy. So the biggest chunk of people that are getting insurance today on public exchanges are these, uh, are, is the subsidy population. They make about 138 to 400% of federal poverty. That's where most of the insurance is being bought. On average, uh, about 75% of that overall uh, cost of health care insurance is being picked up in that subsidy. Um, 
the system itself is really not um, perfect. You've probably heard about companies like United Healthcare have said we're not going to participate in exchanges in the future. Uh, enrollment necessarily hasn't necessarily been the issue. There are some structural issues with those, how the program was designed that need to be fixed. Unfortunately, we're in an environment in Washington where not a lot is getting done. Uh, there's a lot of certainly a lot of animosity toward this program, but the, the takeaway is demand uh, for services has definitely, you know, they're, they're, there's 12 million people that are now getting health care paid for, uh, and they're being, you know, hospitals are getting reimbursed for today uh, for, to, to improve their financial impositions, their cash flows, and their ability to reinvest in capital projects. Um, a lot of focus you're going to see next year will be in the area of getting more young people signed up. Right now, the population on exchanges is a sicker population, so there's going to be a big push next year to see the younger part of the population enroll. Um, this is just a real quick snapshot on Medicaid expansion. There are a couple of big states out there today. Texas and Florida are probably the marquee names that did not expand. Uh, interestingly, this map is the red states are, uh, uh, this is not uh, Democrat versus Republican. It looks a lot like it, but basically these are the, the, the non-expansion states are basically the, the states that went with uh, uh, went, went red in the last election. Um, once again, about another 5 million people we think that could get insurance uh, if you did have incremental Medicaid expansion. Um, this would be a really good thing. Historically, about 8 to 9 percent of all the volume that walked in a hospital and got admitted didn't pay anything. It was uninsured. Uh, that number, for the most part, has been cut in half today. So the finances of hospitals has actually improved quite a bit. The amount of uncompensated care they're dealing with is much less. So cash flows are better here. Um, the part of the Affordable Care Act that nobody knows about, they always hear about exchanges, is like how many people got insured, but there is this thing called affordable care. Uh, that, that's the part that you're only going to start hearing about real soon here, and it's actually underway right now. And the notion here of the Affordable Care Act was, part two was lowering the cost of care, is what I want to mention is a, is a big opportunity maybe for, for you all. Um, that the notion is to pay for health care, and this is in the Medicare population, pay for health care uh, as a bundle. One big uh, check for taking care of, of, a, of a Medicare beneficiary over the entire episode of care, rather than this a la carte menu idea that I was telling you about where everybody, everybody gets paid everything and everybody's submitting bill. It, it shouldn't matter. You want, what you want to pay for if you're the government or anybody that's buying health care is you want to get an outcome for an episode. And these things called BPCI and CJR, these are, these are tests that are being going on in the U.S. right now uh, that are being tried out to see if we can actually develop these systems to pay for health care episodically. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is if you think about that, if you actually gave somebody an incentive to manage care, uh, if you gave, i.e., money, like this is how much money you've got to, to take care of Grandma Sally's uh, hip replacement, if you give one person the responsibility and they go, a contractor, let's call him, and he goes out and gets subcontractors, be it an, a, a nursing home or a rehab hospital or a senior housing facility, um, if you give somebody an incentive to manage that case, what you're going to do is push, when they come out of the hospital on the left side, there's this economic force called money and economics that are going to try to push that person efficiently through the system. Today, that doesn't really happen. When you're discharged from a hospital, you can go through any one of these settings, bounce around uh, well, with identical conditions and have two totally dramatically different bills for the same service. So the idea is to try to uh, standardize uh, and move people more efficiently through the, for, through the continuum process. So what does all this kind of mean and like from, from a trend standpoint and what I would be thinking about? The big trends I would say in healthcare today are you are going to see the trend of more out-of-pocket costs. There's absolutely no doubt about that. What that's going to do is to force me and all of us here to become better consumers. Uh, there are apps out there already today like Yelp uh, that if you do need to go to an MRI, you hit the button, it'll tell you who, which imaging center has the lowest price, how far it is from where you are at that very moment. Uh, we, are, we are probably less educated about health care than any other decision, any other consumer decision we make in our lifetime, but we are going to get smarter. So you, sh you should definitely expect uh, consumerization in health care and certainly education about how to buy health care. You're going to see more retail health care. It's coming. As you pay for more of it out of pocket, guess what? You're going to have, your demands are going to change and there are going to be people that cater to, to those demands. Um, you're going to see a continued move into outpatient services. I'm not saying that hospitals won't continue to grow, 
but certainly a lot of the growth areas, you probably see it in things like uh, uh, urgent care centers. You're starting to see freestanding emergency departments. Uh, all these outpatient settings will continue to grow. Uh, and then the other trends that I think you're going to see here are in the area of value-based purchasing, sort of like what I was talking about with the bundle payment system, that those trends are going to continue, coordinated care trends are going to continue. So um, I wanted to just throw a couple of ideas out there for right now. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker, and then uh, maybe we can answer some questions if you have time to think on this. Thanks. All right, great. Frank, thank you very much. And next up, uh, kind of representing the engineering construction and also covers a little bit of manufacturing is Mr. Stephen Fisher. Uh, he's an executive director with UBC Financial Research in their New York offices and brings more than 15 years of experience to the firm. Steve covers two subgroups within the indust industrial sector, machinery and engineering and construction. Uh, Steve's franchise is defined by unique proprietary surveys that provide clients with insight into everything from machinery inventory levels to rental equipment dealer sentiments to the mood in Washington. So with that, welcome Stephen to the podium. Stephen. Good luck, Steve. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for having me here. It's been a pleasure to speak with a number of you over the last couple of days. In case any of you are wondering what research analysts actually do, I thought maybe we could start off by doing a little research. So if you'll indulge me with a show of hands, I'll ask you one question. And that question is, what do you expect business conditions for your company to be like next year compared to this year? Better, this, uh, worse, or the same? So by show of hands, business conditions, you can define them in any way you'd like. Better next year? How many people think so? Worse than next year? And the same. Okay, so I think it's a balance between better and the same, so that, that's good. Um, not too much negativity here, um, because it is what I would consider a challenging environment. We think there's too much capacity of a lot of things in the world, uh, things like commodities, manufacturing capacity, and perhaps even in certain cases, engineering and construction services. Uh, but before you think I'm picking on the group, there's clearly far too many stock analysts as well. So, you know, yeah. what's fair is fair. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, we think there's always a number of plants and buildings that need to be upgraded, replaced, maintained. Uh, so we think there's always going to be a, a good baseline of work. So, you know, some bright spots, certainly. Uh, will oil prices rebound? That is clearly a, a key question. We're watching Gulf Coast investments. It's my view that I think we'll see a bit of a slowdown over the next year or so as oil prices have come down. Project activity is, is slower to move forward. Uh, but I think it's still going to remain elevated. There's still clearly more projects in the pipeline. And so I don't think it's going to be a disaster, just a, a bit of a slowdown on the Gulf Coast. As we think about United States non-residential construction most broadly, we see a flattening of that, uh, of that activity in 2017, following about 5% growth this year. And that flattening, in my view, reflects growth in the public sector side, highways, streets, transportation, transit, uh, offset by a slowdown in the private sector, commercial, office, manufacturing. One of the, the nice things about the ENC sector is that it's a long cycle business. As we heard about this morning uh, from Sidara, these projects take a long time to go from the planning, the engineering, to the execution phase. And what that really does is it gives we ENC analysts the, uh, the chance to really think about what are the themes, the long term themes that are going to drive capital spending. And, uh, and what could really move the needle for, for the companies and the stocks. And there are some good things happening, and, and we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. So I've long said that ENC stocks are driven by three specific things, oil prices, backlogs, and themes. And I've used Floor and Jacobs here. Uh, you could easily substitute CBNI. Um, but uh, if you look at the top two charts, comparing uh, Floor, Floor and Jacobs stock with oil prices, they trade pretty closely together. And the charts below that 
This is backlog. When backlogs rise, the stocks tend to outperform, and when the backlogs fall, they tend to underperform. Kind of makes sense. Theme the themes we'll talk about in just a minute. I I'm not going to spend too much time on oil, but my colleagues on the oil sector at UBS think the oversupply is expected to come into balance over the next year, uh, and they're looking for $57 a barrel on WTI in 2017, and that would certainly be helpful, I think. Shifting over to backlogs now, we said oils, ba oil backlogs and themes. So backlogs here on the left-hand side, I like to look at the backlogs for the companies I cover in aggregate. I think it kind of gives me a, a better picture uh, more broadly. And you can see, starting at the left-hand side of the chart, 2004 to 2008, we had a, a really nice run-up in backlog. Uh, then in the financial crisis, it pulled back a little bit. We had another pickup between 2011 and 2014 with mining, the shale boom. Now we're starting to see backlog come down a little bit. And I think it's, it's my view that as we go over the next 12 to 18 months, we'll see backlogs again glide down a little bit uh, before hopefully picking up again in 2018, thereabouts. Uh, I don't think we're gonna see a sharp fall off a cliff, but uh, we see a moderation. And on the right-hand side, this represents uh, the street consensus expectations for earnings for the group uh, for 2017 and how it's trended that expectation since 2000 and the end of 2015. And basically going back to the conversation we had at the beginning about too much capacity. So when you think about what that does, pricing pressure, light bookings, uh, slowing of revenue burn, uh, that's leading uh, we as analysts on the, across the street, uh, myself and my, my competitors, to, uh, to cut the earnings expectations. But I mentioned themes as the third thing, and this is where it's a little more positive. So we, we do think there are a number of things, these long cycle, long dated uh, trends that, that will be driving CapEx over the next several years. Petrochemicals. We still have low feedstock costs here. There's more projects in the pipeline. Looking forward to more activity there. Gas-fired power plants, we're still shifting away from coal, building more gas-fired power plants as replacements. On the infrastructure side, we have improved visibility with the Federal FAST Act that was passed in, uh, in the end of 2015. And I put here nuclear decommissioning. I'm not sure how many people broadly think about this, but uh, this is a long-term opportunity. These are very, very large multi-billion billion dollar projects to shut these nuclear projects, plants down uh, safely. Now on the bottom, I've got some valuation charts here looking at the group and aggregate over history. And one of the things that, that Mr. Bechtel said yesterday was that if the industry doesn't deliver, people are gonna go elsewhere. And I think we found that unfortunately from the investor perspective, uh, investors, have been looking at other industrial areas or just other categories in general. And you can see that the valuations of the NC stocks are, are a bit below uh, the long-term averages. But I do think there's, there's reason to believe that that can be changed and improved. Now, many of you were nice enough to fill out a survey that we sent out ahead of the conference. And what I wanted to do is present the results to you uh, today of, and these are effectively all, all your input and your thoughts. Uh, I was thinking that perhaps we could do this on an annual basis and track the data series uh, over time. But really there's, there's four key points here. And the first is that capital spending in 2017 is expected to be broadly flat as compared to 2016. Progress on current projects has been intentionally slowed down of late. Project owners are pushing more aggressively for supply chain and cost reductions more aggressively than normal. And while ENC companies amongst the respondents are divided in their responses on the outlook for backlog, uh, there's a bit of a negative bias. So real quickly, we'll go through what some of the, uh, the, the, the charts look like in these responses. So on the left-hand side, this is the project capital spending outlook 17 versus 16, you can see it's a fairly balanced uh, outlook. Uh, what we did on the right-hand side is what is it gonna take, what, what drivers, what are the drivers of this project, project capital spending? Uh, you can see it's economic growth, selling prices, 
you know, these are kind of the, the two key factors. Uh, we did have a conversation today at, at lunch, election, politics, that, that could also be a restraining factor this year as well. Uh, in terms of the backlog outlook, uh, what you see here, uh, the, the very big wedge on the left-hand side, we talk about uh, pushing for more cost reductions, 62% uh, you think they're, it's more aggressive now. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the 38% wedge there. Uh, this is the expectation for backlogs year over year uh, next year, so a little bit of a negative bias on where backlogs are. And then just wrapping up here, uh, as it relates to oil projects specifically, uh, what is most important in getting these new projects going? It's, you know, you can see overwhelmingly two-thirds, both the level and stability of prices is key. And on the right-hand side, uh, we asked about, uh, you know, are projects being slowed or, uh, or kind of kept on pace and a little bit more of a bias towards slowing projects. Uh, so with that, I'm uh, turn it back over and All right. thank you. All right, Stephen, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, what we'll, uh, what we'll do now, we'll open it up to questions. We have four people out there with microphones. Where are you all at with the microphones? So what you want to do, if you want to capture their attention, you have a question, raise your hand. They'll come over to you, bring the mic. Again, if you could state your name and your company, and then ask your question, and we'll just work through as many questions as we can. So who would, uh, who would like to ask the first, the first question of the panel? Just by show of hands. Well, I'm only, going to, I'm only going to call on people I like, so do you mind as well just raise your hand? Who, uh, we've got one right up here in the front. Hello, i got a question here. This is Brandon Davis. Back there in the back, sorry. Yeah, back in the back. I'll ask the most fun question that probably nobody on the panel wants to answer, but the, uh, you know, what happens, what do you see happening if, say, Trump gets elected? And his, and his nationalistic view, does that impact, you know, trade and manufacturing and, you know, What's your opinion on that? Well, that's probably well, for all, all three well, of you. If you all want to chime in on that one. Well, certainly not a good thing. I mean, his his uh, his views on free trade, his views on uh, on uh, you know penalizing uh, penalizing trade is not good. You know, as I pointed out, the U.S. is uh, the world's largest exporter of refined products. You know, and we recently uh, uh, liberate, uh, liberalized our crude export policy to allow crude exports and. Uh, as I said in my slide, you know, a, a free market has been a, really the underpinning of the, the reason that U.S. refining industry has, has done as well as it has compared to refining industries in the rest of the world. So, you know, that's all bad. You know, now I don't, I personally don't believe if Trump gets elected that he will do any of that. But uh, who knows? <laughs> I'll take the, uh, the domestic angle on that. And I clearly would, would agree with the uh, importance of global trade. But, okay, if we're going to be focused on the domestic markets, what are we going to do in the domestic markets? And I think the question I get is often about infrastructure spending. Is there going to be more infrastructure spending? And generally, I mentioned in my comments that I think we will see some growth in the public sector uh, moderating against some, uh, some of the, uh, the, the moderation in the private side. Uh, the big challenge with infrastructure spending, is, as many of you all know, is there's always needs just where you're going to get the money from. And, you know, I think if either of these candidates can, can find a way to get the money for infrastructure spending, I think that'll be fantastic. Uh, I, I wonder, the skeptical side of me says, you know, it's a great campaign uh, approach to take, but still, you know, no one in the last... 10, 20 years has really come up with a good way to, to find a lot of incremental money for infrastructure. So, you know, we'll be hopeful, but uh, a little bit skeptical. Um, I'd say in the world of healthcare, the, the, the obvious thing that he has said is he will repeal, but he also says and replace Obamacare. So well, some of the Republican candidates said they would repeal it, and that was the end of story. But at least he has said he would replace it, and there's not a lot of details on how he would actually replace it. but. I actually don't think it matters uh, in the sense that if you think about the numbers, you've got, you know, 22, 23 million people incrementally insured. By the time the next president sworn in next January, you'll have another open enrollment period, another couple of million people in. So if, if you just, you know, the ability to just walk in and say, okay, 25 million Americans now have insurance that didn't have it three, year, three or four years ago, it's going to be really hard to just, you know, cut that off overnight. So. 
um, you know, I think uh, obviously there's not a lot of de details from uh, the, tr the Trump campaign there, but I, I think it would be hard for anybody, quite honestly, to just completely repeal it. Um, so from my perspective, I think that doesn't mean there wouldn't be a lot of noise, say, in the, in the stocks, but in the short term, but I think in the long run, it probably will still be there. Okay, great. We had a question over here. Was that your question? Okay, great question. How about back here in the middle? Yeah, uh, my name is Ron May. I'm with uh, DTE Energy, and I, I kind of hope you like me. I didn't Here's hear. the deal. Oh. Uh, low inflation, low interest rates. When does that change? Well, I guess I'll take a crack at that. Uh, low interest rates, low inflation. And I think when I look at a lot of my industrial sector, like I said, I cover both machinery and uh, ENC, I think we really need an inflationary environment. Commodity prices, really, I think, drive so much. You know, you, you build out, this is a, a late cycle, long cycle industry. You know, you build these things out when the economy's going great and you just need more capacity. And I think the fact that, you know, we have low, in, low interest rates and, and low inflation, that's, that's just a real challenge. I mean, maybe on the flip side is it helps the financing costs of, of projects. But I think if you ask anyone in, uh, in the industry, you'd probably like to have a little more inflation and a little more economic growth. Well, I mean, I, I'm not an economist. I focus on the refining industry. We, in, our, in our forecast, we assume that a relatively low inflation environment uh, continues for the next 10 years. And that as far as oil prices go, we, you know, what I saw from, uh, from uh, UBS's uh, 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 forecast, we're relatively in line with that. We see we're in a new era where a relatively low and stable crude price environment will be achieved over the next two or three years and stay that way. For the next 10 years now will underpin that low inflation uh, environment. So that, that's our assumption. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. I think if uh, you do have, uh, I, I think either one of these candidates, uh, based on what they've done and said, could disturb that environment. All right. Next question. Um, Got. <clears throat> Arnie, can they cut these lights? Yeah. No, they can't cut these lights? Mike. I'm going okay. to the conference. Scott Rubin on. with Hilti. Uh, so given the uh, excess or too much manufacturing capacity, you mentioned, Mr. Fisher, and the relatively slow economic growth that, that we certainly saw in the last quarter and for a while, uh, any chance that we see actual deflation? We're actually seeing it. Um, and I'd put out a note in, uh, and, and you know, maybe it's not so broad, but in, in my world, we're seeing it. I'd put out a note in July of 2015 I said, could we see deflation in machinery prices? And it's something we had pretty much never seen before. Caterpillar, Deere, these guys always report pricing improvements. And shortly thereafter, the second half of 2015, early part of 2016, we're now dealing with, and maybe not so much in the, in the ag because it's a very concentrated industry structure, but in construction equipment, we're definitely seeing pricing pressure, um, and so prices are coming down. We are seeing that deflation, and it's uh, it's concerning. We need to we need to see that that level out. And it's a real challenge, and it's forcing uh, companies to really rethink their cost structure. And on the flip side of it, you know, for the last year or so, they've been enjoying lower input costs, uh, but now that steel prices are are coming up. Uh, for various reasons, where uh, you know, they, they may be squeezed because demand isn't strong enough to push pricing up, but they got the input cost squeeze, and, and that, that's a real challenge. Next question. Yeah, John. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, refining business, you mentioned in the presentation that the uh, U.S. converted over the last 10 years from importing refined products to exporting refined products. I think you mentioned four million barrel per year, if I'm not mistaken. And also you mentioned 80 projects are, are in, in pipeline or under construction. It's, it's a clarification. I want to know how many refineries were built over the last 10 years to support the four million barrel per year. 
or per day? Yeah. Well, the, the actual shift, and I was a net number, the actual shift is over 5 million barrels a day. We were, back in 2005 and 6, we were importing over, uh, over 2.5, 3 million barrels a day, and now we're, we're exporting. Again, this is a net number. We're actually exporting more than that, but our net product exports are uh, 2.5 million barrels a day. So it shifted by over 5 million barrels a day, and that's come from a combination of decreased domestic demand. We've actually lost uh, uh, 1.2 million barrels a day of domestic consumption in that period, even though in the last couple years the demand has picked back up again in a low price environment. Uh, but uh, a net of 1.2 uh, million since 2006. So, and then we built, you saw we built almost a million barrels a day of additional capacity, uh, and so we've been able to thrive even, and in the past, prior to 2005, when domestic demand was sluggish, the refining industry suffered. But refiners, by taking advantage of the, the shale boom, lower gas prices, lower crude prices, increased efficiencies, uh, they've been able to, to thrive even in an environment where domestic demand fell and, uh, and actually add capacity in that kind of environment. Now, I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand the, the total point of your question. Uh, you're, you're, you're to, to, to it's a clarif clarification, uh, looking at the number or the million of barrels that produced per day, and looking at the, the stringent environmental regulations in the states, and also I'm aware that the, the, there are no refineries built over the last 10 years, new refineries. I'm a bit trying to understand or at least comprehend how this big number of million barrels per day increased in the market. Well, Probably the, the 80 projects that you mentioned is supporting this. So, so the clarification is what are these projects to support this yeah. million well, barrels per day? Well, I actually, you know, he's, they always say that thing, no new refineries have been built. You know, when Motiva put in their 300,000 plus a barrel a day expansion at Port Arthur, that was essentially a new refinery. It just happened to be uh, a new re new train at an existing refinery site, but that was actually the single biggest refinery build in hi U.S. history, you know, at, at that at one time. So that that was even though it was built on a brownfield site, it was essentially new greenfield capacity. And then we've had similar, you know, uh, Marathon's expansion at Garyville, you know, for 200,000 barrels a day. Uh, that was again a new refinery train, essentially like building a new refinery. And in total, you know, we've, we've had, like I said, over 900,000 barrels a day of additional refining capacity added to the U.S. refining system in that time, period, even though there's only been, you know, there's actually been one supposed greenfield refinery built, which is that small uh, Dakota Prairie plant that Tesoro just purchased up in North Dakota. Uh, you know, so that was actually a greenfield plant. It was 25,000 barrels a day, but all these large expansions uh, contributed to that uh, uh, overall capacity increase much more than that, you know, than any single greenfield refinery. So the, the, the saying that we've never, we haven't built a new greenfield refinery since ni the 1970s is, is sort of uh, misleading. So and there's been a lot of uh, small uh, refinery, you know, 20 to 50,000 barrel a day incremental expansions at, a, at a, a new, and 5 to 50,000 barrel a day expansions at numerous refineries to respond to uh, uh, this positive environment for, for the U.S. refining industry. Oh, does that answer your question properly? Actually, we own half of Motiva, our company, or more than half of Motiva. So I'm aware of, uh, of the expansion of Motiva and also the deal. Uh, my question, uh, other than Motiva, is there any expansions in the big refineries in the States? I didn't hear the last part of that. I mean, obviously, the, the biggest. Are there any expansions other than Motiva in the refiners in the states? In the la I mean, Garyville was a huge expansion. I mean, that was essentially what I think is a, a 200,000 barrels a day. Um, and we've had, uh, you know, multiple others. They all add up to a net expansion. And, and, and during that time frame, there were some refineries shut down as well. So we actually had more capacity added. Uh, the, the net number was 930,000 barrels a day of additional capacity added in the last 10 years in, in the U.S. We now have over 18 million barrels a day of capacity, the highest number we've ever had. Again, I, I hope I'm answering the question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Any other questions out here? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm going to shift a little bit uh, away from refineries. Hassan al-Assad, you're on. 
Uh, I've heard, which is not from this panel, the question is for all you panelists, economy and technology question. I was uh, in a different setting, and they say that what happens in the U.S. affects, starts with the U.S. and affects the rest of the world, economically and technology. And specifically said, starts from California. Is there any fact in this uh, myth? I didn't catch the last part of the question. Can you repeat the question? Would you turn it up? We couldn't hear the last very part of the question. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. So basically, there is a belief that the economy in the world starts with the U.S. So anything happens in the U.S. affects the economy that, and just the economy that goes all over the world, specifically technology as well. And someone was saying even starts from the West Coast, California. Is that any fact in this? So if I understand correctly, so the, the U.S. affects the world economy. In, in, the, in the U.S., does it start from the West Coast and move east and then move to the rest of the world? Or is there any direct impact to how the U.S. affects the world economy? I think it's the, is that the, that's that's the right. question kind of for all three of you all. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess I could say a couple things that uh, to the extent that there is uh, a lot of imports coming in from Asia that would go through West, Court, West Coast ports that would then drive a lot of freight activity, you know, that might be one way of arguing that that could be true. Um, I guess the way I would think about this more broadly here is to say that you know, we think generally you know, consumer part of the economy in the U.S. is okay, the industrial side's a little more challenging, and, and why is that? I'd focus on what's happening in, in China and in Europe. That, that's where my personal bigger concerns are, and that will kind of just affect the, the economy in, in general. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, without some government support, the Chinese economy is going to be slowing down, and that will be a challenge for commodity prices, com a challenge for industrial companies and across the sort of west to east, east to west, wherever you are. Um, and then you have this whole uh, European situation uh, with the UK vote to leave. That, that we're watching very carefully. Um, so I guess to conclude, yes, maybe exports uh, or imports from, from Asia might cause a west to east, but more broadly, I'm looking at what's happening in China and Europe. All right. Well, with the oh, we got one probably yeah. last question right here. All right, Jeff Barto, Burns and McDonald. So, a question for John and Stephen: uh, With the projected refinery capital spend in Asia uh, over the next 20 years, the significance of the slide you had up earlier, how do you see the role of U.S.-based D&C companies uh, involved in that work? Well, again, uh, the demand growth uh, will be led by developing countries. The uh, baton, uh, the lead will be of, uh, of that will be passed from China to India to other developing countries over the next five to ten years. But we still see strong demand growth, and as a result, strong potential refinery uh, construction activity in Asia Pacific, similar to what we've seen in the last uh, ten years. Uh, we don't. So, so I, I see opportunities for EPC companies there, which they already are getting involved with. And that is where most of the opportunity is going to be. The U.S., as I showed, is, is, uh, has a healthy refining industry. I think it will maintain its uh, leadership, its competitiveness, but I don't expect capacity additions beyond where we are now. There might be some additional rationalization, potentially on the East Coast, and there might be some incremental uh, capacity increases in other places, but I think we, our, our current base case shows refinery capacity staying relatively steady in the U.S. going forward. So the opportunities uh, for new refinery construction uh, are going to be primarily in developing countries. Now uh, we still have that big base, and I, I know uh, uh, Steve mentioned that there's this big base of you know 18 million barrels a day of capacity. There's uh, continued need for defensive capital spending and maintenance spending, 3% of replacement cost for maintenance, one half for 2% uh, for defensive, continued needs for spending for all those other factors that, that I mentioned that are going to drive the need to stay competitive. So, you know, you know we're still going to be spending, you know, that 8 to 9 to 10 billion barrels a year on capital 
uh, uh, spending in the U.S., but the big opportunities are going to be overseas. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, and I guess another component of my question I left out initially was with all the greenfield spend going in uh, in Asia there and with the – how do you see the impact of the national oil companies in that region of the world and how we interact with them on those projects? Well, I, you know, it's, it's going to be – we'll see how that evolves. I mean, obviously, we've had evolution in China where they've – uh, liberalized uh, the ability of uh, independent uh, so-called teapot refineries to buy crude and sell products. So we'll see if there's more liberal liberalization in that direction. But I don't think that's going to come very fast. So I think national oil companies uh, in most of those countries are going to are going to drive it. Now in India, uh, you know, I, you know, you have two very strong independent private companies, Reliance and and SR, that that exist and who have been very uh, good and efficient at building refineries and very aggressive in expanding. So there's opportunities there to deal with a non-national company. But most of those com countries, you know, as national oil companies, I think are going to continue to, to um, you know, drive the boat. I would say there's maybe two aspects to it. What we see from the U.S. E&C companies uh, relating to, to activity in, in Asia uh, certainly, a company like CBI that has a great technology portfolio, selling, uh, licensing technology for for new plants over there, doing engineering design work. Um, to the extent that there are more Western companies that are that are building out over there, there's there's great opportunities to work with them. Uh, maybe one more unique element: Floor Corporation is investing half a billion dollars into a fabrication yard. In, in China for onshore and offshore work there. So that's a, that's a unique opportunity. Um, but otherwise, I think we sort of just view the, the new big plant construction that they could be involved in as sort of kind of one-off opportunities here and there in the region. All right. All right. And with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'd like to thank Frank and Stephen and John for your time. Really appreciate it. <laughs>